Hello, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Stein uh, for being here with us. Uh, we are going to discuss about uh, his uh, very uh, soon to be launched uh, in Romanian uh, book, Map of the Soul. And for this purpose, uh, Gabriela Denise, uh, senior editor for uh, um, Editora Herald will be here, will be joining. Thank you very much, Gabriela, to be here today. Yes. Um, and uh, also we are going to discuss about uh, an event that we are going to held uh, uh, on November uh, 13th, um, um, where we are going to have the uh, chance to have uh, Dr. Marie Stein uh, as our uh, uh, visiting uh, lecturer visiting uh, professor, um, uh, an event on the midlife uh, and uh, afterwards uh, 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 challenges. Uh, I'm just uh, going to take the opportunity to present um, uh, Dr. Stein. Uh, he's a training and supervising analyst uh, at the International School of Analytical Psychology, Zurich, ESAP, Zurich. Uh, he's been uh, president of the International Association of Analytical Psychology and president of ESAP Zurich and the lectures internationally. He is the author of Jung's Map of the Soul, Minding the Self, Outside, uh, Outside Inside and All Around, and many other books and articles. Four volumes of his collected work uh, writings uh, have been published to date. Uh, he lives in Switzerland and has a private, private practice in Zurich and um, from his home in uh, Goldwill. Uh, Dr. Stein, thank you very much for being here today with us. And Gabriela, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much for uh, giving us this opportunity to talk, uh, especially about the book that we recently published at the Editora Herald. We translated in Romanian this year and published it, Jung's Map of the Soul. And um, just to start because I prepared a few questions and my first thought was why this metaphor? How did you come about this metaphor? How, uh, how it inspired you in writing the book? Because like I, I was saying, the book is very compelling and revealing. It's a different kind of introduction to Jungian psychology and it's surprising uh, the way you follow it like a quest in discovering after all um, the center. So why the metaphor? How did you come about this metaphor? Well, I followed Jung on that because Jung um, often talks about himself as a pioneer or an explorer. Um, and he uh, saw himself as belonging to that early generation of um, scientists and investigators who were looking um, uh, at the human psyche in a new way. They were discovering the depths of the unconscious. And so this exploration of the inner world um, lends itself to the metaphor of um, discovery and exploration. And I thought, um, if somebody is discovering and exploring, what do they do? Uh, and if you think of the early explorers who set out on the high seas and, and uh, explored the new world, um, looking for India, they discovered North America and South America and so on. Uh, what did they do? Well, they mapped it. They would go along the coastlines and they would make a map so that people coming afterwards could use their uh, uh, the knowledge that they had gained in their explorations to take it even further. And so I saw Jung as creating um, a map of the inner world from his own explorations, uh, also with the idea that other people would then follow uh, his guidance, um, uh, his, his map, and make their own explorations and maybe discover even more about the inner world than he had been able to do in his lifetime. So he saw himself as an early explorer. We're now a couple of generations later, and um, other people have used his um, theories and his concepts that I call a map to go on the same quest and discover their own inner world. Um, and um, each person's inner world is unique and different, but the map is a kind of general orientation 
to a territory. And it's very useful if you want to go on this kind of a journey into the inner world. Yes. And I think um, Jungian ideas and theories permeated the entire cultural world in the Western culture. <laughs> And uh, we can speak now about archetypes in many fields of activity. We can speak in the, related to movies or literature or uh, culture itself. And um, I, in the introduction of the book, because I don't want to, I don't want to go in very detail. I want to be a surprise for our readers <laughs> to to read this book like I did with. Um, question marks and what's going to be next, you know? And um, uh, why do you think it's so important to speak about Jung, the scientist, and why we have to emphasize this? Because that was one of the main ideas that you used in the introduction, that Jung was a scientist. Mm -hmm. Yes. Jung was trained as a scientist. Uh, he's a medical doctor. He went through a scientific training to become a doctor. His schooling and his cultural orientation was towards science. So he's working in a cultural world that uh, uses science as a method for discovering truth about, about the nature of the world. Um, and so his approach was in, uh, in line with or, or in... Um, uh, and a similar type of orientation to scientific work that is done in laboratories or by scholars who are investigating um, uh, archaeological digs or anthropo anthropologists. Uh, it's a scientific method. It looks for data and facts, and then it puts these facts together in a certain way, and it creates hypotheses and theories out from the facts. So that's the way Jung worked. So it's in not his nature, in his nature, he was a mystic. Yes. So there's this combination between nature and culture. In his nature, I think he was a mystical sort of person. The the the, um, the membrane between his consciousness and another world, let's say what he called the world of the unconscious or the spiritual world, whatever you want to call it, was very thin. And he could move back and forth very easily uh, between these two worlds. And he had that from childhood on. It was in his family. It was a kind of given gift, a kind of mystical sense for another world, uh, an invisible world, a spiritual world. So that's in his blood. But his training is science. So he combines the two. And he says when he discovered psychiatry, when he was a medical student, he saw these two streams coming together because in psychiatry, you explore an invisible world, the unconscious, but you do it in a scientific way. So for him, psychiatry was the path, uh, a, a culturally acceptable way of doing the kind of explorations he wanted to do, which in other times and circumstances might have been called spiritual work or mystical work. Sometimes he was called a mystic and I think he was in his heart. He was a mystic, uh, given to visions and big dreams and symbolic meanings and synchronicity, all these things that he writes about would normally be considered a kind of mystical um, approach to life. But he did it in a scientific way because of his training and his culture. So he combines the two. And I think we do need both. Uh, facets of our uh, existence and our thinking, both the scientific mode of thinking, critical thinking, and also this opening to spirituality, so we can be <laughs> complete in a sense. And to bring them together, not yeah. keep them apart. You know, a lot of people have them both, but they keep them apart, apart. compartmentalize. He didn't compartmentalize. He made them interact with each other. And so yeah. he created his theory, which is this quasi-scientific, but also spiritual theory. It's a, it's a very interesting mixture or combination, say an alchemical wedding between these two types of thinking. Yes. <clears throat> so, um, I'll say that the chapter that I read with most interest was the chapter about libido. <laughs> 
uh, probably because it, it was um, it came with a different explanation of, of what the libido is and how it uh, acts in in the mind, what the role of the libido in our mind, and. Um, reading about uh, regression and progression of libido and the way symbols are created was very interesting to me. So it was revealing also and um, a concept very useful in my practice because I'm also a psychotherapist. But um, what was for you a concept that had such an impact in your practice? Like um, how you discovered new nuances of this concept and how it helped you develop your practice. Mm -hmm. I'd say the one Jungian uh, uh, concept that I've worked with the most in my writing, also maybe in my practice, is, the, uh, is his idea of uh, individuation as a lifelong developmental process. Jung has often uh, been called, is considered, the first lifelong developmental theorist in psychology. In other words, he extends the development of a personality uh, way past childhood, which was focused on by Freud and, and Winnicott and other psychoanalytic type thinkers, extends it throughout the whole life, uh, lifetime, lifespan uh, of a person's uh, existence in this world. Um, and that idea um, caught my attention very early. Um, uh, and I've, I've written quite a lot about it in various different ways. Uh, so I, I, if you ask me, what is my, I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's the one I've leaned on the most or the one I've used the most in, in teaching and writing. Uh, it's the theory of individuation. First half of life and second half of life um, ego development, ego self-access development uh, in the second half of life. And one can do so much with this theory clinically um, and uh, theoretically and, and culturally. Um, but it goes together with the theory of energy or libido because uh, libido is the driving force. It's the electricity in the system. Um, it's the passion in the system. It's where life takes you with a passion. And um, the libido is directed by um, certain preferences, uh, typological preferences. If you're an extrovert or an introvert, it flows in a certain way. Um, but it also pushes you uh, into a developmental process, the individuation process. And as life goes on, your, your libidinal attachments and commitments and interests, passions change. And that change uh, is something that we'll talk about in the, uh, also in the seminar on midlife because midlife is an important moment of change from one direction of libidinal uh, expression and passion to another one. And that shift sometimes causes a crisis, lots of questions. Um, what we call a liminality period or uncertainty. Um, and so this flow of libido and uh, the individuation process, those two ideas really go together. Mm -hmm. And they're both useful clinically to, to watch in clinical work. Where is libido blocked? Where does it regress? Where, where cannot it cannot go forward to help it unblock uh, as a therapist and so on. So individuation can proceed. I found all the concepts in the book very interesting and especially in the way you explain them and related, relate them with quotes from Jungian uh, books and um, your approach to every concept it's, uh, is really interesting and it helped me understand better. Though I read other Jungian uh, introductions, this one was... Um, it was very clear to me, made things clear, like a map. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, just to ask you, for our readers at Editora Herald, uh, can you say a few words for our Romanian readers to invite them to read the book? Yes. Well, I, I certainly strongly invite you to read the book, but also to take the journey. You know, a map, uh, it, it's often said the map is not the journey. 
um, a map gives you uh, a, a kind of, uh, if you sit down and look at a map of North America, let's say of America, uh, and you study the map carefully and you know the difference between Texas and California and New York, but you haven't gone there yet. So going there is another experience. So I invite people to use the map, but to go on the journey. Uh, go on the journey safely with an analyst or a psychotherapist, if you can find one. Um, and uh, I think have the experience that Jung is writing from when he uh, is uh, talking about his, uh, his concepts. All of his ideas are based on experience. That's, that's one feature of Jung's work. He doesn't uh, just spin theories out of, out of the air. They're based on his personal experience and his clinical experience. And then from there, he elaborates uh, theories or this, or this map. Uh, so to have the experience um, is the second step. You look at the map, read the map, you get an impression of what it's like, and then you go on the journey. So that would be my recommendation to the to the readers. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Gabriela, for uh, addressing these um, very thoughtful questions to uh, Dr. Stein. I would like to take over and uh, <laughs> ask Dr. Stein about uh, uh, what is going to be the key, uh, let's say, key message or uh, key uh, unrevealing or revealing depends um, secret um, behind this idea of midlife, not only midlife crisis, but also midlife transformation and uh, all the challenges uh, that uh, are going to be uh, met by all of us uh, after this. Well, uh, I will certainly focus on transformation and what is it? Um, in a book I wrote, um, uh, called transformation emergence of the self. I use the metaphor of the of the caterpillar and the butterfly, and the caterpillar is the first stage, and the butterfly is the second stage. Okay, and there is a moment when the caterpillar uh, goes into a, a a metamorphosis, into a cocoon, and dissolves, and then um, a new pattern forms while it's in the cocoon, and then opens the cocoon and out flies a butterfly. So you you've got a, a transformation. It's the same creature, the same ego, you could say, uh, the same I going through the process, uh, but it has a very different um, form and capabilities in the second stage from what, but both stages are important. So I'm going to talk about that shift, uh, the midlife transition or midlife transformation, and then uh, focus on uh, the second half of life and some of the differences between what we call the important psychological tasks or developments in the second half of life. How is that different from what has taken place in the first half of life? And, and particularly a change in the sense of identity. Identity is a term we use quite a lot in psychology, uh, uh, but it's not fixed. Our identity evolves and changes in the course of a lifetime, um, either because of inner developments or outer developments. Um, I know um, when young people have a child for the first time, their identity changes from being a child to being a parent. So, and a sense of different sense of responsibility comes about. Um, and so this same thing happens uh, in this transformation from the first half of life to the second half of life. One changes from being a follower to being a leader, for instance. It's a very important change. And how does a leader orient himself or herself? They don't orient themselves by looking to others. They orient themselves by an, a vision that they have. Where does that vision come from? So I'll be looking at things like that. For um, oh, actually for uh, the large public, but uh, especially for the psychologists, it's uh, mainly important this uh, transformation or this transition that uh, happens uh, in the uh, midlife, so to say. Uh, it, I believe it's uh, going to be important to mention that this is a process; it's not a moment uh, on which uh, people uh, th that people encounter can encounter a midlife uh, at uh, 30 or at 60. 
and I believe that's a, a really good uh, uh, food for thought subject, so to say, um, for everyone to 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 approach. That's why uh, our society, the Romanian society of uh, Jungian analysis, uh, invited uh, you, uh, Dr. Stein, to have this talk because. Whom, uh, have, uh, whom would be better to speak about this, uh, if not you, because you are also an author, an author uh, the author of a book called uh, In the Midlife. That's right, yes. That was one of my first books. I wrote it while I was in midlife. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm actually- I'm looking forward to discussion, uh, Lavinia. I would like to hear from uh, the students. Uh, Maybe they could even pre prepare questions in advance, but I would like to have a dialogue also. I will speak, of course. I'll give some uh, lecture style uh, um, uh, information and so on, but uh, I would also like to engage with them uh, in a dialogue. So if they have questions or if they have um, insights, I would like to um, speak with them. And yes. Yeah. Yes, it's important uh, just to say that the, this event is going to uh, uh, last for four hours in which we are going to have uh, um, periods of question and answers. And uh, as always, this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, times dedicated for questions and answers uh, sometimes are not enough. Uh, of course, a lot of questions can be raised, can be asked, but uh, we are actually looking forward to, to hearing your uh, your talk. And uh, since I know you for uh, such, uh, <laughs> for uh, quite a long time until now, I know that you uh, are a, um, a very senior scholar that brings um, things from many uh, areas, not only uh, a psychological uh, uh, approach, also a maybe spiritual approach to this uh, matter or a cultural approach, a social approach, because in midlife, all these uh, paths are uh, uh, coming uh, together. Yes, yes, I certainly will do my best. Um... I'll probably divide the, the day into a theoretical and a clinical part. So the Excellent. theoretical about how we think about uh, midlife and transformation, and then how is that? Uh, how are those ideas applied clinically when we work with people in the first half of life and the second half of life? <laughs> because there's a difference. And, and our clinical approach is adjusted according to where a person is in their individuation process. So we need to always keep that in mind. Well, we certainly uh, look forward to this um, uh, already wonderful and very exciting event that we are waiting uh, to to um, to be part of uh, on November the 13th. Uh, we encourage everyone to enroll, and we have also uh, discounted prices for students um, and uh, for other categories of people. But uh, this. Uh, uh, is particularly important because we open this to the public. Thank you very much, Dr. Stein, and we are really looking forward to uh, seeing you on November the 30th. Thank 30th, you. yes. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.